Thanks for coming. I'm going to make this very brief because I'm going to have a chance to speak later. We have decided to speak in this order. And I'll introduce myself uh, later. I guess I'll say a word now. I'm Peter Suber from the Berkman Center, but that's all I'll say for the time being. Uh, each of the panelists will introduce themselves and then uh, give a few opening remarks. And after that, we'll talk to each other, we'll talk to you, we'll take questions, and we quit at 3.15. So first up, Cable Green. Thanks, Peter. Uh, hi, everybody. I think I know everybody. Um, so my, my job is to just o introduce the big concept of open policy. W what is it? What are we talking about? Why do we care? Uh, why are we even having this particular panel? So um, let me start with the, the big goal. Uh, and I'm going to say things that seem obvious, but hopefully woven together they'll make sense. Uh, the big goal that I think most of us share is that everyone in the world uh, deserves the right. And in fact, given the tools that we have today, uh, we could provide access to an affordable, high-quality, uh, education for everyone on the planet. We all know that we've got the internet, we've got the affordances of digital things, we've got open licensing, um, and we've got a, a, a mass willingness to share among enough educators uh, producing enough high quality materials uh, that in fact if we're smart about this and we resource it properly, um, that we in fact uh, can make that dream come true. So that's my personal starting point. That's why I am here in Boston at the Hewlett meeting. So if that's the goal, then I think the next question is, um, then how do we maximize these, these tools that we have? How do we maximize the opportunity of open educational resources, of uh, open access around journals, of open science, open data, uh, open government information, et cetera? And part of that, and I, and I ask that question for two big reasons. The most obvious one is a resource question. Uh, this takes money to do these things. Um, the good news is it takes significantly less money than the current proprietary commercial model, uh, and significantly less. Uh, but nevertheless, it takes uh, still a large amount of resources. And as we all know, uh, many of us are beneficiaries of uh, the, the kindness of foundations to spearhead this environment. The bulk of the money by far does not sit in foundations, it sits uh, in, the, in public funding. And so part of it is a, is a resource question. How do we move uh, public funds all around the world at all levels of government uh, so that the default uh, that those public funds purchase is open and that closed or proprietary becomes the exception? So how do we get there? One reason is to, to, to the sustainability question. How do we have the funds to resource this movement in a way that it can accelerate quickly and we can truly pay for, distribute, et cetera, the highest quality uh, educational and, and research resource materials? The, the second reason is that when you change policy, you change the rules uh, and behaviors of folks that operate within those rules. So uh, most recently in the United States, there was the Department of Labor uh, grant, this $2 billion grant. CC BY was required. People who were applying to that grant, and I talked to many of those community colleges, they looked at it and said, yeah, yeah, one more requirement, check the box, move on. And then they, when we went back to them and said, do you realize what you checked? Do you realize what that means? And, and even after they understood, they said, OK, fine, we don't really care. It's just a requirement to get the money that we're trying to get our hands on so we can do the work that we want to do. Fine, yeah, it makes sense that this is public funds. We should share what we build. To them, it was really not an issue. They didn't want to debate it. It was that the rules had changed. And to get the resources to do what they wanted to do, they were more than happy to comply with the rules because those were the rules. And, and they, the conversation, as far as they were concerned, was over at that point. They wanted to get on with the work. Um, and so I think that's a inter very interesting and important aspect of, of open policy. So what is open policy? Uh, very simply, open policy is publicly funded resources are openly licensed resources. Now, it, it's just, it's even better if publicly funded resources go directly into the public domain where, where nobody holds the po copyright and we all have access, no attribution required. That's, I would argue, ideal. Uh, but in many cases, that's a, that's a harder argument to make than to allow somebody to keep the copyright and ask that they put, or not ask, require as a matter of open policy that they put an open license on what it is that they build. So I'm going to uh, wrap up <coughs> with just uh, a couple examples um, that I've been involved with recently. Um, as many of you know, for the last four years before I uh, joined Creative Commons, I was at the Washington Community and Technical Colleges. Um, we looked um, internally at our system, built, realized that our um, curriculum was not only out of date, but we were not 
engaged in the OER conversation at all. We were too arrogant and weren't using anybody else's materials. Uh, we were also not sharing with each other, and this was a, just uh, looking within our system was a massive inefficiency, and our students were suffering for it. And the uh, most obnoxious example that I use over and over again is our one highest enrolled course in just the Washington Community Technical Colleges was English 101, and just Washington, just community college students in Washington spent upwards of $9 million a year buying that one book for that one course, and that happened year after year after year. And we spent about $1.2 million and built the entire uh, first 42 courses, highest enrolled courses, and had textbooks that were between the cost of zero and $30. And we gave it all away for free, and it's all CC by license, and now faculty are starting to adopt that. At the system level, we adopted an open policy that said, if you take money from the system, and the nice thing about the policy in Washington community colleges is that all the state money, all the federal money, all the foundation money flows through the state board and then out to the colleges. And the policy shift was if you take competitive grants from our system, you will put a CC by license on you, what you build. If you don't like those terms, don't apply for the grant. Right, so uh, to be very clear about policies, we are talking about requirements. These are not optional conversations. When we're talking about policies, we're either talking about law change at national government levels or we're talking about strict <coughs> policy changes at institutions, systems, et cetera. Because you don't want to have these arguments. You want to be very clear uh, that public funds uh, are, are open. And then uh, one last comment, and I'll get off, is that, uh, frankly, this is good public policy. Um, if you sit down with public policymakers and you ask them, uh, you are the stewards of the public taxpayer money that you're responsible for, and they will say yes. And you ask them, are, are, do you feel responsibility to be efficient and effective with those dollars, those federal dollars or those state dollars or those system dollars that you are responsible for? And they say, yes, I am. I am responsible for that. That's part of my job. And then when you point out the existing systems that they are funding and the existing massive inefficiencies. Again, in my state, in K-12, they spend $130 million a year on K-12 textbooks for only 1 million students, and the textbooks are 10 years out of date, and there's only paper, and the kids aren't allowed to write in them. And those are, that's 10 years on average, the textbook's out of date. Many of them are 15 years out of date. I say to the policymakers, do you find that acceptable for an investment of $130 million a year? And they say, absolutely not. And the only way to change, not the only way, one of the major ways to change those kinds of inequities, those kinds of massive inefficiencies with the huge amounts of public money that's spent on education, estimated at approximately three trillion globally a year, is to change the open policies. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you, Cable, for framing uh, all the policy discussion. Uh, I'm Carolina, uh, I coordinate the OER Brazil project, um, but I'm also a lawyer working on the open movement for a long time, so I, I wanna also bring a broader perspective and, and, and point that to you, but framing it on what's happening in Brazil and what is this discussion we, we have there, right? Uh, so at the multinational level, we have, we, we have been taking this discussion to forums like uh, the WIPO, the World Economic Forum, and uh, the Inter-American Bank of Development. So we, we talk to these folks, so when they go and talk to our governments, we have some uh, positive feedback on that loop. In, one, in some forums, more than others, of course, you can imagine how the discussion goes in WIPO, uh, but it's something that we are trying to do uh, within the discussion of exceptions and limitations there, right? And with the expansion uh, of, of the IP uh, norms through bilateral and multilateral agreements, we are having many issues uh, that are impacting the reform of copyright law in Brazil and actually other Latin American countries that may even make cop uh, co creative commons illegal in some parts, right? So in Brazil, you may have heard that uh, we have article in the bill that's being proposed just to change our copyright law saying that any license you would have to register uh, in a notary, right, and 
Creative Commons doesn't work like that. So if you have that requirement and people don't register their Creative Commons license, that would not be enforceable. So we face these barriers in, in we face these barriers in this broader con con context, and we really need to take those contexts in uh, in consideration when we are uh, talking to policymakers and even be the building alliances. Right? We try to bring alliances from our foreign ministers and and other ministries, not just the Ministry of Education. Um, we also partner with other sister movements, right? It's always trying to bring what is the positive of OER, which is very similar to many other movements, such as the open access movement, the open data movement, and the free software movement. And Brazil is very strong in free software, so of course we need to partner with that movement, right? So what are the other movements in other countries that you can identify and partner with because they already have been heard, right? Brazil, many states have laws that give priority to free software, so why not? Uh, get a ride on that discussion that's already in place and, and, and already had identified the network uh, and, and the uh, political alliances there. Um, and finally, going deep a little bit at the government, state, and city level, uh, as we discussed in other sections here, we all need to understand better our education systems, right? And the question on how to start, start by understanding our education systems and finding similarities cross-border, right? So uh, by identification, the, uh, by understanding the educational system in, in Brazil, we could find similarities with US, Poland, and other countries and try to cooperate with these countries, uh, uh, framing the language for the policies that are being developed. Uh, and in that sense, we, we are working with the legislative and the executive. And of course, you have to build trust, and, and you have to, to build expertise in the legislative uh, branch, and you have to present the numbers. So when all of you say, we need metrics, yes, we need metrics, and all the time. And these metrics need to be presented all the time and reinforced. And we need economic metrics, but you also need impact met metrics. So when I was talking earlier today about the, the, the Folias project, which is this open test book project from Paraná State, they actually presented better grades. And they are trying to analyze if the use of open test books were, was related or not with those better grades. Um, but at the same time, sometimes it's, it's good to, uh, uh, as Ronaldo also mentioned, uh, a think of ways to introduce OER in ways that the politicians are not paying much attention. So when you have call for proposals or, or call for bids to develop, for example, mathematical edu uh, educational resources in mathematics, um, uh, there are people in the Ministry of Education that are adding at the uh, last minute, but you have to have a CC license. So how you build these this alliances that at the last moment somebody can drop that tweak uh, uh, on this public purchases process. Um, finally, at the state level, Brazil has US. Uh, one of the differences, our uh, adoption process uh, happens at the federal level, uh, but that doesn't mean that the states are binded to, adop to adopt those test books, so the states can review that list proposed by our Ministry of Education and then adopt whatever test books they want. So you have space also to work with the states, right? And the states have laws about it, and, 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 and they receive funding from the government, the federal government to purchase test books, but they also have a lot of money purchasing and developing educational resources. Um, and I, I see that we were discussing uh, with Doug yesterday night how it happens in the US. So I think it, it's, a, it's a cross between what you have in California, Florida, and Texas, with the open states, right, uh, at that sense. So we have some flexibility to work there and how we, we try to identify within the curriculum places we can insert OER at these uh, uh, lists that the government put forward has uh, materials that schools should be paying attention to or should be adopting because the government said they are good materials to adopt. And at the city level, specifically, uh, um, there was a work with the executive in Sao Paulo City, and again was that point that he re the, 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 the politician, the secretary of education of the city, really liked the idea uh, and moved fast. So suddenly we had a decree declaring that everything produced by Sao Paulo City, which, by the way, is the richest city, in, is one of the richest cities in the country and has 
big purchase powers. The publishers are in, are in Sao Paulo, some in Rio. So they have a, a pretty important domino effect in the system there. They turned the key and said uh, through a decree that everything that's produced and purchased by the city needs to be OER. Um, at the state level, as uh, I mentioned to some of you, we already got two uh, positive feedbacks uh, in terms of approvals from two committees at the state level, and that's moving really fast. So I'm, I'm, I'm very glad to see that, that uh, moving. And, but I, I also think we have some challenges to face, right? Um, and that I'm here to actually ask your constant help. Uh, there's a lot of fear. Right, all the laws that are being pushed forward in Brazil, they have language bringing CC BY non commercial share alike, right? And this is an issue for us. Uh, we try to have that to be BY, but was something that was really, really difficult to, to, to accomplish. Why? Because there is a lot of misinformation about CC, right? So I think that CC through the Open Policy Academy and, and the, the repository has a great role to play helping us to break this misinformation, right? I don't know if you guys know about the situation with our Minister of Culture. Um, we had Gilberto Gil, which was a, a great uh, ally of Creative Commons, uh, close friends with Lessig. They were all the time together all over the world, and Gilberto Gil left, and we have a Minister of Culture that uh, is spreading uh, a, a lot of misinformation of CC. And I say misinformation because many of us from this network of uh, uh, people that work in copyright and other areas, we have informed them, but they keep uh, the, the news in the, uh, the stories in the news, they still are pretty misinformed. And finally, um, and they say CC is not, legal in Brazil, CC is against authors in Brazil, so all the, those issues, right? Um, and we also need um, to partner with publishers, I think, in many, in many situations. Uh, so in Brazil, the publishers, uh, we have like a, a situation with six major publishers, they are multinational publishers, and they have the monopoly in, in, in the test book industry. And, they will not move for many years. They, that will happen. We don't have the same pressure as you guys have in the in US. We don't have uh, the pressure from user test books. People do not adopt use test books. One minute. OK. Uh, so the pressures are different. So the, 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 the weight of the publishers are different. So we've been trying to talk to them about new business models. So maybe some research on, on open business models in this area would be really relevant. And they actually call us and say, do you know anybody to work with us to do some beta testing on open business models? And there is still nobody in, in Brazil uh, on the business side on that. So uh, I think it's, in, it's always important to, to see what is the, the role of, of everybody in this ecosystem and, and try to move everybody in this in a positive way. So thank you. Thanks, Carolina and Cable. I think you've set the stage really well. Um, I'm Catherine Goge. I'm the project director of OER Africa. And uh, we work, it's an initiative of SADI. And we work primarily in the higher education sector um, in Africa, working with universities and trying to sensitize them about how um, open educational resources can be a means of improving teaching and learning. Um, most of these higher education institutions that we work with uh, do are, are government funded, so um, it speaks to the point that Cable was making about uh, releasing these uh, materials as part of the public good. So one of our first tasks when engaging faculty and staff at universities on OER is to, de to demystify the term, because um, it means so many different things to so many different people. And we explained to them that at its core, um, OER is a legal concept. It's about how you license teaching and learning materials in such a way that they can be easily shared with others. And that this is different then from copyright, which actually closes um, such materials off from being able to be shared. And then we share with faculty some of the possibilities that OER creates, particularly within the context in which we work, um, which are typified by scarce human and material resources to deliver uh, quality education, an ever-increasing demand for that high-quality education, and an environment within which technology um, and connectivity are becoming slowly but increasingly available as tools for delivering higher education. And so we suggest to them that OER is filled with the possibilities. Um, possibilities of integrating quality OER into course design 
as a cost-effective means of updating and modernizing curriculum. The possibility of using OER as a stepping stone towards the development of human capacity to design course materials and curricula. And the possibility of using OER as an impetus to revisit and modify curriculum on a regular and systematic basis, and thereby ensure that it's continually being renewed, continually, continually being made relevant um, to the world of work and to broader society as a whole. So over the past four years, when we've been working with the universities in Africa, we've come to see that engagement with OER is, does not necessarily need to be a process of voluntari voluntarism, um, or even something that we just do because we think it's a good thing to do. We've observed that OER, um, if it is not useful or relevant to an institution, is just not going to gain traction. Um, and OER can only be useful if it contributes in some tangible ways to improving both teaching and learning. Um, we found that when the process of development and adaptation of OER is guided by a very real need for resources and the relevance of the resources, resources available, then the use of openly licensed educational materials has provided very practical opportunities for learning or relearning pedagogical skills, such as materials development and course design, acquiring technical skills, such as using search engines and properly labeling resources. Kathy was talking about metadata earlier, um, so that you're Im improving the searchability, the findability of these resources. And it's also served the need um, to, for students to acquire, for example, basic clinical or nursing skills, where the relevant resources either didn't exist at all or didn't exist um, in the languages that they, were that they were required, or they were simply too expensive to acquire legally. And in many instances, collaborative endeavor has been uh, an integral part of these processes of creating these materials. So as we've advocated for the use, the adaptation, and the sharing of OER within and between institutions have, of higher education, um, we've learned the importance of being absolutely explicit about what an institutional investment in OER might comprise. Um, on Tuesday, Barbara mentioned that with every opportunity comes a cost or a challenge. And we have to be clear about that from the beginning. People don't like those kinds of nasty surprises coming up on them um, in the middle of things. Um, time is one of those costs. It needs to be accounted for. It needs to be paid for. Um, faculty time to create OER, to search for OER. Um, awareness has to be built. Um, links to OER networks, links to repositories, um, using these networks and these repositories as a way of rendering visible um, Africa's intellectual capital and avoiding the marginalization that has so often um, been the bane of Africa's participation in the global knowledge economy. Um, champions, they need to be nurtured, they need to be supported. They can be individuals, they can be units within um, institutions, but they need to have credibility, they need to have passion, and, and they need to have a place within the institutional hierarchy that actually allows them to either develop or to implement the policies that will allow OER to be integrated within the institution. And finally, those guidelines and those policies, um, they have to be designed in such a way that both faculty and administration know how to do OER um, in a way that does not contradict either the, the university's vision or measure, mission or existing policies. Um, and so we found that um, working, when we're working with faculty, we found that an over-reliance on lectures as a means of, de of delivering the curriculum can be tempered by the judicious use of OER as part of a planned investment in resource-based learning. But an institution's strategic decision to use, to employ resources, resource-based learning, can only be sustainable if it's supported by a policy framework that recognizes and supports the use of faculty time in devising those sorts of materials, the sorts of materials that will encourage students to solve problems by demonstrating creative and critical thinking. And we've also found that it's imperative that those who are expected to make use of new uh, technological initiatives are not just interested in working in new ways. They're not just keen and eager, but they're actually supported and equipped with the skills and the tools to make use of and exploit these new technologies. Um, so for example, um, it's in, in many universities that we've worked with, the IT department has been that department that comes around to service your computer when it's on the blink, um, or to help you to you know, sort out computer glitches. Um, but more and more, if people are developing resources that they need to put online, um, they need to start thinking about how you design resources, they need to be thinking about how you uh, stitch them into a curriculum. So these elements of 
pedagogy of course design that weren't necessarily part of people's training um, unless they were taught as teachers um, rather than as subject matter experts, which is why faculty are usually hired, become increasingly important. Um, so we found that the existence and the implementation of a policy framework that, that supports this pro progression of faculty from chalk and talk to this more facilitatory role um, of being a guide on the side, a coach was the term that was used earlier um, in the earlier days of this conference. Um, these sorts of supports are, are imperative. Um, and we've also learned working with our partners that uh, unlike at a, a national level um, that Cable was referring to, at a university level, at an institutional level, policy is actually a set of guidelines. It justifies the allocation of resources but it doesn't actually, um, it's not really a means of compelling faculty to do anything. It's very difficult to get faculty, university faculty, to do things that they don't want to do. There are always going to be those faculty who are quite content to do things the way they've always done them. Um, and so it's important then to be working with the willing, uh, not to spend too much time working with those who don't want to move with you. Um, and so uh, uh, we found that an, an OER policy framework um, needs to cover at least four main areas. I'm winding down now. And, and the first is that it has to provide clarity on, on IP um, that is created during the course of employment or during the course of study. Um, it needs to explain how materials created while you're working at that institution can be shared with others or cannot be shared with others. Um, policy needs to talk about, um, um, it needs to provide clarity in terms of the HR guidelines about whether, for example, the creation of, of artifacts like learning resources constitutes part of the job description of staff, um, and what are the implications for staff development, for performance management, for remuneration, for promotion? Um, does publication in an open access journal count for the same as publication in a, in a, a peer-reviewed journal? Um, ICT is another very important area that uh, an OER policy needs to touch on. And, and this is about access to and use of appropriate software, hardware, access to the internet, technical support, and so forth. And the last area then is that of materials development and quality assurance, um, so that you're ensuring that materials that are created and shared as open by your institution are actually appropriate um, um, and that they're of a quality that you are proud to share uh, with the rest of the world. And we're clear that both at the level of designing policy and implementing policy, there'll be lots of successes and there'll be lots of failures. Um, and we need to learn from both of them. Um, and we're also aware that institutional policy, um, however good um, to be absolutely effective, probably needs support at both a national level and an international level, the sorts of things that uh, Stamenka and, and uh, Sir John were talking about um, yesterday or the day before. Um, in the past few days, we've heard OER described as a, a, as a way in, as a Trojan horse, as a pathway, as a disruption. Um, and we feel that w whatever uh, term you want to use to describe OER, if it's a way of getting us to focus on improving teaching and learning, um, on, on making sure that our faculty and our students are equipped with the 21st century skills of critical thinking, problem solving, creativity, working with others, um, that we're creating people who are able to uh, constantly evolve as a global economy and the world of work is constantly evolving, then, then OER can only be a good thing. Um, conversely, the risk is that if we allow ourselves to become overwhelmed by the sorts of gaps that Cathy was just talking about within the OER infrastructure, we, we might actually just do nothing. So we have to do something. We, we can't afford to miss the opportunity um, to use OER and to use OER policy as a tool to harness the time um, and the resources needed to improve teaching and learning. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Doug Levin. I'm an executive director of the State Educational Technology Directors Association. Um, I'm very pleased to be here and actually to be following um, all of my colleagues here to my right. Um, I will um, echo, I think, and maybe elaborate on some of the uh, points that many of them um, have made. Uh, I almost feel uh, apologetic to say that I <clears throat> work in formal K-12 education in the United States. It, has had a bit of a bad uh, rap over the course of the couple of days here. Uh, and the folks that I work with actually are the technology leadership in state departments uh, of education. Uh, Jeff Mao in the uh, audience uh, serves in that role in the state of Maine. 
uh, is very active as uh, chair of our board um, at the moment. And um, we are working in coalition with a number of um, Washington, D.C.-based organizations to help coordinate um, advocacy activities for those in the community. And um, uh, Linda Pittenger from CCSO and Reg Lichty from Education Council are part of that team, Susan Patrick from INACOL, uh, as well, and then, um, you know, certainly um, welcoming m many other uh, friendly faces in this room um, and also not in this room who are part of that. And really, collectively, I think our goal is to cross this chasm, you know, to make OER mainstream. So um, what I want to do is talk a little bit about why um, we believe that policy is really is an important pillar of this ecosystem. Uh, the sorts of uh, policies that we need, but not so much the arguments um, for why OER. I think we, we'd love to talk about that. Uh, we can certainly talk a lot about that or even about the specific U.S. opportunities, but I do want to share a few principles, I think, as we think about OER policy advocacy. So um, why policy? So K-12 uh, in the U.S., uh, it's, it is a public institution. Um, it is highly regulated industry at the federal, state, and local levels, uh, very complex governance structure with layers of legislation, regulation, and policy, some of which is circumscribed by the courts, uh, and it ends up prescribing um, how resources uh, are spent, whether that's time or money. Um, we talked a lot about innovative business models and innovation and disruption, but at the end of the day, we're talking about the market for publishers. Well, the government makes the market, period. So, um, you know, the publishing industry is selling what formal education is buying. So therefore, if we want to change the market dynamics, ultimately you need to change the behavior of the buyer, which is the government. Um, and then thirdly, uh, those who currently benefit from how the system is structured understand this deeply. They know how to influence, to seek advantage, and to either stop or slow down the pace of change. So broadly speaking, if you're interested in, it, we, it seems to me that we need, we absolutely need a change in this policy set, broadly speaking, and really at three levels, at least at two levels. So first is, uh, no matter what, you need policy that even allows the possibility for OER to arise. And certainly uh, in things like textbook policy, there's fundamental policy that is completely, if not, <clears throat> Disallowing OER is incredibly OER unfriendly. So that needs to be stripped away just to even get onto a level playing field. Secondly, you could talk about sort of OER friendly policy, policies that would allow OER to sustain and flourish. But they may not be quote unquote open policies. But if any, uh, an aggregator or, a, or an OER publisher was interested in jumping into the market, they would have the same opportunity to do so as a commercial publisher. Uh, and then finally, we've heard about open policy, right? So policy that is explicit about changing the current model and mandating the use of open. Uh, so this may be the sort of holy grail of what folks are talking about. So um, a few challenges are, are in thinking about um, OER advocacy from, from my personal perspective. Um, OER is not the problem. Uh, it's a solution, and policy gets made to address sort of a crisis or a problem. Uh, every crisis uh, we define has a, constitu a constituency that we're sort of taking on, saying you're not doing your job well enough, um, and requires then different allies to move it and make it happen. Um, for many of us, including uh, myself, I think the easiest hook in K-12 uh, is textbook policy. I'd say that warts and all. Um, it is not perfect. Um, the textbook model, I would argue if, uh, that at the end of the day where I would love to see things, if I could wave my wand, is not that we have a proprietary print textbook and then it's just an open textbook. I think that's helpful. It's a step in the right direction. It's not about the changing of the teaching and learning and the whole process and how students and teachers are interacting uh, and continuously improving um, their work. That's not all the way there. Um, I'd say thirdly that there's more than one way forward um, and that language gets in the way and that there is no neutral language. Even uh, Kathy's talk previous year says we shouldn't say free, we should say no cost. Well, <clears throat> it 
somewhat semantics. Nicole and I were joking yesterday. We were like, we just invent some new words. Well, if it was easy, we couldn't do it. And it depends, you know, the words mean different things to different people, right? So, and, and so in different conversations, you have different ways to talk about this. For some, it is a values discussion. Particularly in education, it's very compelling to talk about open, and I think people get it, like green. Oh, it's open, I get it. Um, for others, the lead may be digital, and certainly my organization is, works with technologists. It's an obvious uh, hook. We've heard a lot about technology here, and there's an intersection. It's absolutely not the same thing, but they're related. Um, uh, but there is no one model or no one way, and uh, in the policy uh, discussion, you need to be flexible uh, about that. Um, I would say that passing the policy is the beginning and not the end. Um, uh, it may be a really hard fought, <laughs> uh, difficult fight to get it passed, um, but uh, I think as was um, uh, pointed out well, uh, it's hard to mandate uh, quality implementation uh, or even implementation at all <laughs> in some cases. Um, and policy being a sausage making uh, process is never perfect. There are always unintended consequences. And we have examples already of policies that I think would be very encouraging. State of Texas passed open source textbook legislation, but has yet to actually get anything through that process of any substance. Uh, Virginia uh, legislature launched the Virginia Open Education Curriculum Board that is meeting for a couple of years and is now doing a lot of navel gazing. Um, and I serve on that board. It's, source of some frustration. Um, so, uh, and even, um, and uh, uh, would say even the federal government has made statements and passed policy, but implementation is uh, uneven. Um, so at the end of the day, we have to remember the goal is not the policy change, the goal is a change in practice. And, and we can't keep our, take our eye off that ball until, you know, if, if we ever can. <laughs> um, uh, and so, Next point, uh, one bad example sort of spoils the bunch. Uh, every time we spin up a policy initiative, whether it is really just a press release opportunity um, or even something much more substantive, and there are challenges with it, uh, it does reflect back onto uh, future conversations with folks. So we all have a stake every time someone steps forward and said, this is an OER policy, this is, there's a speech, there's a press release, there's a policy passed. We all have a stake in that succeeding because we're all gonna live with the consequences. Yesterday, there was even a conversation um, with Boundless, which is now facing a lawsuit. So the still conversation is, that is gonna reflect on everyone, no matter the specifics of the case or of that company. Um, two more points. Uh, policy advocacy can be shockingly simplistic in how it works, uh, but the details end up mattering uh, quite a bit. Uh, if for no other reason than to understand sort of the, the, the devil that you're creating <laughs> for yourself and the details. Um, we talk about Common Core as a huge opportunity in K-12. I absolutely believe that it is. Um, get down to brass tacks. It gets awful complicated on what is actually common and how common in, um, it will be over time. Uh, technical infrastructure uh, is lacking and there's a lot of complicated things uh, that need to happen there. And we can't mistake a clear view for a short uh, distance. Um, the choice of the open license, Carlina talked about, huge implications. Uh, uh, and, that, and so these are really tough issues. And in the policy process, you may not really be able to deal with them, but you really do need to understand what, what you're driving at. And then finally, the final point, at least from my experience, is that if you're not at the table, you're for lunch. So, um, uh, if the frame is sort of textbook innovation, uh, anytime there's a conversation about that, the open community has to be at the table. We can't walk away when we say that it has to be open and they say, what are you talking about? No, and you take your marbles and go home. It doesn't work like that. You need to come to the table, keep yourself at the table. Opportunities will present themselves. Um, uh, relationships will be built. Um, uh, the example was given uh, that, you know, uh, the, the, the best case scenario is you have a policy being written at the last minute, a little piece of language is inserted and it skates right through. That only happens from building the relationships that happen over time. So it's really important, this engagement uh, is really important. Um, and so as 
the uh, question was raised in the prior session about engagement with some of the trade industry groups. It's really important to do. It's not always friendly. That's okay, but you need to have those lines of communication and keep, uh, keep going back uh, at the Apple. So um, I know we have a lot to talk about, so I'll just stop at that point. Hi everyone, Nicole Allen from the Student Public Interest Research Groups. Um, I work with uh, students and faculty across the country, mo mostly focusing on lowering the cost of higher education textbooks here in the US. Um, and thanks, Doug, and to the other speakers for kind of setting it up. Um, I'm going to actually continue on some of the themes that Doug brought up, just talking about higher education, formal higher education, and how policy fits in there. And, um, just some of the things that we as a community should think about in terms of actual advocacy and how we're approaching policy um, that, as a community. So um, I, I think for higher education, uh, it's a little bit different the way the market works than K-12. Um, I always say it's <laughs> um, equally as screwed up, but uh, <laughs> in a different way. So with, with textbooks in higher ed, um, the decision maker is the individual faculty member, sometimes a committee. Uh, so it's a lot more granular, and demand is highly disaggregated. And each faculty member actually has a First Amendment right to select the materials most appropriate for their classes, and that's a, a right that uh, we always need to respect with policy and can't interfere with. So policies tend to be a lot more market-based because to really change things fundamentally, you do need to change the market. Um, and, and they kind of fall into three categories. So one is creating supply, um, so supply of OER. Uh, Cable mentioned a few ways to do that, um, requiring materials to be openly licensed, grant programs. There's legislation in California to create a library of materials similar to the library created in Washington State. Um, and while that's uh, great, um, making sure that those uh, materials are adopted, it needs to be part of that too. <laughs> Um, so the, the second piece is uh, just changing faculty behavior, and a lot of times this is like voluntary uh, guidelines that faculty senates, faculty unions uh, can adopt to, or institutions can adopt to uh, promote best practices in the institution. And then the third piece is to kind of change the rules of the market, or at least level the playing field so that materials like OER can compete with traditional expensive textbooks. And one example of that is the Higher Education Opportunity Act, which passed in 2008 containing uh, policies that required textbook publishers to disclose price information to faculty when they're marketing their textbooks. So OER doesn't have a sales force to go out there and put materials on faculty members' desks. And the publishers have that. And as a result, a lot of times, um, OER just never gets on the table. And at least by putting price on the table, it makes the faculty members aware of how expensive the materials are. And then when a, a, an option like OER comes up, or open textbooks, um, it's a lot more appealing. So um, I guess the point of that is that it's possible to have OER-friendly policy without even mentioning OER. Um, it's about creating a market where OER can play and an environment where, where OER can flourish. So um, uh, the other thing I wanted to cover is just sort of how we as a movement um, can uh, be more effective advocating for OER. As Doug mentioned, you know, it can be challenging to go in and talk to decision makers about OER because uh, chances are most of the people you're going to talk to, uh, like policymakers, have never heard of it or if they are, they don't understand it. Um, so it's really important that we are very deliberate in our approaches. Um, I mean, politicians deal with hundreds of, of different issues every day. Uh, at the state level, at the federal level, members of Congress, state legislators, govern, like these people tend to have um, a kind of low level understanding across many, many different issues. So to focus on communicating the important points without getting too deep into details is really, really important. Um, so keeping things very simple, not using language, like you should never go into a politician's office and mention, yeah, our materials are licensed, CC, BY, NCSA. They'd look at you like you're crazy. Um, <laughs> and it would take half an hour to explain what that means. Um, and uh, it's also very important to back things up with facts. 
uh, making claims like OER is going to improve education or, um, you know, flipping the classroom will lead to better learning outcomes. If you don't have the evidence to back that up, it's really not going to help anything um, because when you walk out of that office, it's just rhetoric. But if you can leave a fact sheet that demonstrates it, in, it increased learning outcomes 50% or 10% or whatever it is, um, it can be a lot more effective because you can guarantee that um, when looking at uh, adopting a new model, comparing it to the current model, which isn't risky and safe, um, and, and just demonstrating uh, in, in cold hard facts that there's improvement. Um, so another point, just a general principle uh, that's very, very important for grassroots organizing especially, um, that you want to meet people where they're at. You want to start where they are and bring them to where you are. And chances are where they're starting is a long ways away from where you are. So one thing that we found particularly helpful in our advocacy work is to start with textbooks and textbook costs because that's something that everybody can relate to, especially anybody who has kids in college. Um, and start there, talk about the problem, talk about how messed up the market is and how OER can be a solution to that. Um, and then specifically actually focusing on the form of OER that is most familiar, which is open textbooks, which look, feel, and act like textbooks like they are now, except they're OER and can do all these other great things. Um, and uh, I think it's important, um, am I doing okay on time? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, so it's important to remember with policy, uh, uh, if only a well-reasoned argument was enough to enact policy. It's just, unfortunately, it's not that simple. Like right now, we have all the technology we need to solve global warming, but we haven't solved global warming yet because policy is an incredibly complex thing to work on. <laughs> so um, when we're approaching policy, it's going to be a political process and to be realistic about that and, and think about ways to motivate decision makers to make decisions that will support OER policy is really important. You know, not just why is OER good, but why is OER beneficial to this decision maker? Why is it in their self-interest to promote OER? Um, just an example, I was trying to convince a dean at the University of Minnesota to um, uh, launch an open textbook catalog. And the thing that finally tipped the scales was offering to promote them in the media and get them a lot of positive media attention and something like that um, can be the thing that, that enacts the policy <laughs> versus just a really good argument of why it's important. Um, so just, I'm wrapping up, uh, quickly you want to echo Doug on uh, how important it is that policy isn't the goal, it's the thing that the policy wants to accomplish that's the goal. Um, so making sure we don't stop once we pass the policy and, and have a very clear vision for what happens on the other side of the tunnel. Um, and then uh, finally, just um, uh, there's a resource in this community called the OER Advocacy Listserv. Um, which uh, has a, a lot of the people in the room actually on it. And uh, just it's important for members of the community as you identify roadblocks in your work that policy could possibly solve to let us know about what those are and, and, and just ways that the community can talk about uh, solving them. So um, with that, I will turn it over to you, Peter. Thank you all. As I stand up here, I realize I have six to eight minutes, and the whole session has only 15. So we're just about to use up our time in these opening remarks. Uh, so I'm going to try to come in uh, early and then uh, open it up for questions so we can at least uh, hear some of them before we have to quit and go to break. I probably know the least about OER of all the people on the panel, of all the people in the room. Uh, I've spent 10 years working on uh, open access to peer-reviewed research. Uh, and when I started, that was almost indistinguishable from OER and from open data. But since then, each of these separate uh, movements or subtopics has been so successful that you practically have to specialize to be on the cutting edge and know everything that's going on. And I specialized in peer-reviewed research. So my uh, firsthand familiarity is dated. Uh, on the other hand, I've spent my time working on policies for open access to research. And I'm aware that there are some important similarities between these two movements and some very important differences. And I'm going to try to make some uh, recommendations based on 
policy advocacy in the open access world where I think there is some overlap, where I think the similarities justify the uh, recommendations. But if I'm wrong about the overlap, uh, I'm sure you'll let me know. And again, I want to come in short. Uh, six goals or six things that would be desirable to do in policy advocacy. First, uh, know what policy you want. Uh, have a model policy. At least have an idea of uh, what's attainable today. Uh, while you're thinking this over, distinguish between the best you can get today in current political circumstances, giving all the competing interests, giving the level of ignorance and misunderstanding, from what you would really like in the best of all possible worlds. Go for what you can get, but bear in mind what would be even better. Uh, distinguish the different uh, kinds of policies that might be appropriate for different kinds of policy makers. Uh, governments can institute one kind of policy and schools can institute another kind. Uh, one kind of policy might apply to grantees who are seeking funding. Another might apply to teachers who uh, teach in the classroom. Uh, have an idea of what would be a good policy or even a model policy for each of these policy makers, for each of these targets or constituents. I don't think they all have to be the same. Uh, and don't think, uh, just to repeat a point a little bit, that uh, the best you can get today is the best you can ever get. Uh, and don't think that because you have to compromise to get something adopted today that you'll never get what would be most desirable. Uh, second, get some endorsements for your model policy or for your good policy ideas from organizations that actually carry weight with policy makers. Uh, if it's just your good idea in your, when you're standing in the office of the legislator, uh, it may not carry as much weight as if you have an endorsement from, let's say, Hewlett or let's say Creative Commons. And there are a lot of weighty organizations that would endorse a good policy if they saw the strategic value in that and if they agreed with you that it was a good policy. So amplify your voice with the voice of important organizations, organizations that aren't just important to you and the subject matter, but who are also important to the policymakers. Third, get your policies adopted someplace. Uh, examples are better than arguments. If you have a policy in place somewhere, then some school, some government, some institution, some school district is equally learning uh, about how that policy works. It's learning how to improve the policy. That leads to the next one, which is do some research on the effects of these policies. Once you have some policies in place, you can gather data on how well they work. You can write case studies on how well they work, including the ones that don't work very well. You can learn from the mistakes. Next, try to develop some best practices on how to adopt these policies. If you start to get adoptions across uh, several different kinds of uh, institutions, several different kinds of governments, schools, and so on, uh, how did you do that? What did it take? What arguments worked? What incentives worked, like uh, promising to publicize in the media? Uh, things that other people might not expect as they go into the office of a policymaker to make their case. Uh, there's already a lot of experience in advocating policy, but and therefore, there are a lot of uh, recommendations, best practices out there, but is anybody collecting them together? Uh, if you were starting from scratch with your school district or your legislature, would you know where to go to collect the best practices uh, or to get the uh, uh, reflections and reminiscences of other people who have tried this before? Uh, would you know how to learn from the mistakes of other people who have tried this before? Uh, probably not. Uh, this is something that took a long time to do in the open access world. So uh, lots of separate initiatives uh, are necessary, but somebody should be collecting together the experience of all the people conducting those separate initiatives. And this includes collecting together answers to frequently asked questions, frequently heard objections, and frequently heard misunderstandings. Uh, I think one of the most common obstacles to OER is probably the same as it is for open access, which is ignorance and misunderstanding. Uh, lots of the panelists have talked about uh, mystification, confusion, uh, simple ignorance. Who's writing the FAQ for that? Uh, if you are dealing with policymakers or teachers or administrators or parents who don't understand basic concepts, you could try to explain it yourself. You may be very good at it, but maybe somebody else has done it better. Maybe there's a compendium of these uh, frequently uh, asked questions that you could learn from and uh, prepare yourself as you go into these meetings. Uh, when you write case studies or do research on policies that actually work or have not worked, uh, focus on all the benefits that they bring, uh, the problems that they actually solve. Don't just focus on cost. Uh, again, the panelists have made a good point saying the, uh, 
OER have to work, they have to be relevant, they have to be useful, they have to be high in quality. If you simply make the cost argument, uh, you're feeding into a misunderstanding, which is, well, cost isn't the only issue. Uh, and we all know that you can uh, slash costs by slashing quality. You've got to show that this is less expensive and either as good or better or capable of becoming better. Uh, do you have evidence for that? Do the case studies show it? Do the data show it? So as you do the case studies uh, and the research based on the examples that have been adopted, uh, focus on quality as well as cost. Focus on all the benefits that you can put your finger on. And finally, get some discussion and buzz going about the actual examples that have been adopted. Uh, people should be talking about the policies that have been adopted because, first of all, they may not be as good as they could be. Who's going to identify those weaknesses if not the people who know the issues and who care? Uh, if they are good, who's going to spread the word about the fact that they're good? Who's going to persuade the next school district or the next state to adopt a similar policy? Well, only the people who uh, are tuned in and only the people who care. So if this buzz and discussion get going, uh, they feed back to all the other recommendations I've been making. Uh, advocating policy is not the only way to advocate for OER. Uh, you need uh, motivated teachers. You need motivated administrators, motivated policymakers, motivated parents. Well, how do you get them? Well, you get that in part through this buzz. Uh, policy change doesn't create this motivation. It opens the door to people who are already motivated. But if policies uh, create buzz, buzz can turn around and create policies. So don't stop at uh, adopting a good policy. Uh, as Doug said, policy isn't the goal. Uh, changing practice is the goal. But you don't change practice simply through uh, adopting the right policy. Uh, get the discussion going, and then you can spread good policies elsewhere, and you can improve the policies that we already have. OK, I'm going to stop there. which. I guess was just about on time anyway. And yes, uh, Carol. It's, a, it's just a, when, a rapid comment um, about the FAQ, actually. That, that I think it's something really, really important. And uh, in Brazil, uh, we are very few re uh, dedicated uh, to the OER, and, and uh, we are funded by the, the Open Society Foundations. And we really needed to find a way to replicate the impact, right? We cannot be everywhere all the time. So the idea was to build a FAC. And I spent days looking in all these projects that are here in this meeting, and I couldn't find one FAC that I could just for example, translate it, right? So I spent days having to build, of course I had a lot of material that I used, but I had to spend days having to talk about uh, is there quality, are there business models, and of course pointing, to, trying to point to a lot of bibliography to complement, but again, the bibliography is in English, right? And we had to write the fact in Portuguese. So I think uh, if we are like, we need to think about a FAQ that relates all this discussion to policy because people need them. It's not just policy templates, which are also necessary, and Creative Commons is working on that, but also these fast, small things that we can spread around. So, I agree. Uh, uh, my question is actually related to that comment, which is uh, we're not going to we're not going to come up with the strategy in five minutes. But since everyone's here. What are, the, what are the things we could do that would help state and federal level as well as Africa, Brazil, Europe? Like what, what are those things that would help at, at the issue level and maybe not in a specific jurisdiction? And can we identify a few of those things? Concrete actions. Do? Yeah. Is that what you're asking about? Yeah. Yes, let's hear about some concrete actions. Well, so uh, it's a it's a good question. I think uh, the first thing, and it's been a little challenging uh, for me even at this event, uh, a lot of cognitive dissonance is in the opening day because we're talking about informal and formal and K-12 and higher ed and domestic and international, and that's not how policy is done. So I, I, you know, I don't know if we need uh, perhaps working groups, right? So Nicole and I, it's important for everyone to share information, right? Because I think the challenges that we face at a general level are the same. The specifics are very different and actually some of the dynamics are, in some sense are opposite from higher ed to K-12. So I think a lot of part of it is let's just get more granular, right? And then I think the examples that, 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 that you know, the sort of the, the activities that Peter talked about, you know, clear policy set, model legislation, case studies, research, it gets much clearer. I think at a, at a generic level it's just, it, it, it doesn't work, I don't think. So is that to say there's nothing that would help Africa, Brazil, Europe, DC, so state level. Cable. Uh, so, so let me jump in. Uh, I, 
first of all, if everybody wants to stay during the break and go get some drinks, come back, we'll stay. So let me say that first. <laughs> Um, so, uh, as you know, C Creative Commons has a, a global network of uh, affiliates. We've got teams in 72 countries around the world, and they came together last fall in Warsaw, and this was one of the things they asked for. That They said, we need all the things that you all have been bringing up. We need, we need support, we need slide decks, we need FAQs, we need talking points, we need examples of existing legislation, we need institutional policies, and we don't just need them in OER. We need them in open access, we need them in <laughs> open data, open science, uh, public sector information policies, because we as policymakers at different levels in different countries have different policy opportunities at different points in time. And we don't want to do what Carolina had to do, spend two days if somebody else has already built all this stuff, right? So, uh, and this was, by the way, in response to me, only six months into my job saying, what should I be working on? And that was one of the answers. Um, so uh, Creative Commons is going to do a couple of things. One, you probably saw we've already pushed out. We're building, really replicating what the open access movement did with RoarMap, which is a list of really nice open access policies that you can go to and see if you want to build an open access policy. We're right now simply pulling together a list of the OER policies that are around the world, and then we'll curate that. It'll be on a wiki. Anybody can go update it. That's not. It, that's part of the solution, but that's this much, right? Uh, we're also, uh, we'll be putting together and we'll be working with many of the people in the room to build this an open policy institute, which really seeks to address a lot of these questions. And, and uh, the idea of it, and I'll keep this very brief, but the idea of it is sort of big tent. Uh, we'll seek out the experts in the world who have particular expertise in their niche area of open policy. So for example, uh, open access policy is really critical. Um, there are, you know, the leaders in open access poly, policy are people like Peter and the folks at Spark and others, right? Creative Commons is not going to try to say anything about open access policy. We're going to rope these folks in uh, to have, ask them what are the FAQs, what are the slide decks, what are the sample policies look like, et cetera. We're going to reach out to the, you know, the best folks in who are, um, you know, like, uh, you know, Wayne sitting in the top row, right? Wayne has a unique experience and skill set in how do you create that bridge institution that floats between the open space and traditional institutions uh, that seek accreditation, right? OER University is unique in that and, and they've got things to say about how, what, what, what sort of policies work there, um, et cetera. And so the idea is this will be a place that anybody in the world can come to and say, I'm an open advocate in Ghana and I've got an opportunity three weeks from now because I'm in the president's cabinet. This is a real example. All right, one of the CC affiliates, leads of Ghana, is the Secretary of Education. And it just might happen that her policy opportunities, because as, as Doug said, there's different opportunities at different points in time, and you've got to be at the table. She might say, I, I don't have any OER policy opportunities right now, but I have an open access policy opportunity and one on public sector information. Right? And that's the play. What she needs is the slide decks, the arguments, what are the commercial publishers going to throw at her? Right, what's Elsevier going to come do in Ghana to try to screw this up? And what are the counter arguments? And what's the sample policies? And show me the five on Roar Map that I need to look at. And what speech should my president give when he stands up in front of the legislature three weeks from now? Can you put that together for me? And that's what we're going to uh, try to facilitate. In the open access world, we call that the SWAT team. Yep. Uh, when a question comes up and somebody has a chance, you call the right SWAT team and you get the right advice very fast. Sir. Um, so this isn't really a question, but. I've been listening over the last two days, and I mean, I think that there's something for me really interesting is about the proliferation of openly accessible content, however it's licensed, which I think illustrates the fundamental issue that because ICT has moved the tools of production outside of the traditional environments that we've had for the last couple of hundred years, which is the traditional educational institutions and the publishers, um, we've actually fundamentally disrupted the power relationships in education. What I think we're in danger of doing at the moment in OER is um, by making things like open textbooks the focus of policy change. What we're actually doing is we're helping people to feel as if the change is a familiar one again, which means that what we're actually doing is reinventing a policy environment that's educationally fundamentally the same as the one we came from, even if some of the business rules change because we can cheaply produce that textbook. Instead of actually focusing on the fundamental educational transformation that needs to take place, because of that disrupted power relationship. Um, and it, it really does worry me that, that the policy change focus is 
say exclusively on issues like staff incentives and open access policies and copyright policies. Now, I'm not knocking any of those. Those are engagements we have in OER Africa all the time, and they are critically important. But it seems to me if we're not also tackling the much more fundamental problems of curriculum uh, and the way in which we think teaching and learning ought to happen and what we mean by content and how content gets used in educational environments, then I think we, what we're really doing is we're, we're allowing OER to be co-opted by the mainstream and regurgitated as something that's fundamentally untransformative. And so I think that if we don't tackle that policy challenge, in the next couple of years, the entire transformative potential of OER is just going to be completely blunted. Sorry. I'd like to hear from the panelists on that, but first I have to make a little announcement. We are past 3.15, and I was just told that one consequence is that the session will no longer be recorded.